Good evening. Um, this evening's uh, Bible reading comes Paul's letter to the Romans, chapter 5, verses 6 to 11. From verse 6. You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous man, though for a good man someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? For if, when we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? Not only is this so, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. This is the word of the Lord. Well, good evening, good to see you, some of you again, and greetings to you uh, if I haven't seen you this morning. Now, tonight's uh, passage is different from this morning's passage, and I chose this one because this is one of my favorite passages, but I believe that this is also going to be a really uh, a needful message for some of you. As I was preparing, I was convicted of that. It was uh, year 1983 so far back in time from now, I just came into the brand new student into year seven high school. You know the feeling, you know, you sort of feel lost and it's a new school, new building, you don't know where the classrooms are, a bunch of people that you have met before, new teachers, you feel a little bit apprehensive and very nervous, et cetera, et cetera. So, I started my days like that, and a few days later, the, the kids started to whisper to one another and said, um, look, you know, that, that guy is uh, the tough guy. You know, that guy is, uh, used to be in year six in the previous primary school. He, he basically had the whole school under his you know, fists, so to speak. So I sort of listened to that and took note of that. And then, you know, as it happens in many cases like this, you know, he started going around and basically uh, make his presence felt. You know, he would take things from kids, sometimes, you know, give uh, a little bit of, you know, bashful fists um, to make sure that he gets his way. He's, you know, making his territory. And then one day he came to me, (laughs) sitting on my desk um, with my brand new mechanical pencil, if you remember that from the 80s. It was the new, you know, thing of the the time. And, And he saw that. So he just wanted to snatch that uh, from my desk. And I'm not usually that kind of guy, but I've never been in a fight. But somehow, it might be my Taekwondo training back then, I just felt a little confident, and, and I grabbed hold of his neck, the shirt, and said, put it down. <laughs> and then he looked at me from, like, standing, I'm, I'm sitting down here, looked at me and said, um, okay, he put it down to my surprise, and, and other kids were quite surprised um, by his action. You know, he would just go and bully other kids more normally, but I somehow managed to do that and you know, sort of kept cool for the day. Um, but you know, a few days after, he came back to me again, and then he started to sort of you know, uh, make sure that I know that he's, he's the boss. Um, and you know, he probably found out about me. You know, he was probably sussing out about me and, and realized that I'm, I'm no one. Um, so, you know, I spent next three years very uncomfortably in, in the class. He was in the same class for at least one or two years out of the three sort of middle school, you know, junior high school in Korea. Um, and I remember um, just feeling very uncomfortable whenever he was around. I actually made an enemy in the classroom, unwittingly. Um, and the three years, you know, when he was around, it was just very, very tense, and I did not feel comfortable at all. And when I remember that, and look at the passage before us in Romans 5, I wondered, how would it be like to have an enemy in your life? 
and especially that enemy is present in your presence. It's not a nice feeling. I mean, do you have enemy? Or have you had enemies or someone you call enemy? But so many people live with enmity between them and God. And that's all non-believers. That's all the people who are not saved, people who do not call Jesus their Lord. And then also there are some Christians who put themselves in that similar position. And of course they can never find any peace. So we'll have a look at that through this passage and see really what it means to us and what we can learn from this. And the focus um, that I want to sort of, you know, uh, the, I want to have focus on verse 10. It says, while we were still enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son. In fact, if you look at that verse, in my version, in my translation, it says, for if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God. It's not a conditional if. It basically is saying, if this is the case, then then this would follow. So if something and then something else. In fact, this is saying, if this is how we are reconciled, even though we were enemies, that Christ came and died for us, and then, it says in verse 10, we shall be saved by his life much more. We can be saved by his life that was sacrificed for our sins. It magnifies the, the second clause. It solidifies even more. The text goes on uh, from verse 6, that, that section. Of course, you know, if you, um, you know, don't wanna, we don't want to take this out of context. We know what Paul's talking about. Paul's been talking about justification by faith all along. In chapter 5, verse 1, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So we have peace with God. We were enemies of God, but now we have peace. We have been reconciled to God. And he's unpacking that. And in verse 6, he says, Now, we were still weak. And at the right time or due time, Christ died for the ungodly we. That's us. And then verse 8, he says, but God demonstrates his own love towards us that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. In fact, he goes through like three stages here. We were first weak, secondly, we were sinners, and then thirdly, in verse 10, we were enemies of God, and we were reconciled to God. Each step intensifies the message. First, it says in verse 6, we were weak or without strength. What does that mean? We were weak in doing what? It simply means that we were unable to bring ourselves to God, unable to save ourselves for sure. We cannot save ourselves by works. We cannot save with our efforts. Nothing in us is able to save us. In fact, there's nothing in me that is any worth, as we just sang that song. It is all in Jesus Christ. Without Christ, we are unable to come to God. And that's why even you know, when you become a Christian, you think that, Yes, I went to the church, and I did the Bible study, I heard the gospel, I put my hand up, and I walked the aisle, I made the decision. Sometimes you think that, that you made the decision, and you chose to believe. But we know that, as we learn the Bible, that it is all the work of the Holy Spirit. He's been at work in my heart, and it was Him, it was God who made the initiative and brought me to hear the Word of God. I did not have any strength. So when we were without strength, that's when Christ came. At the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. And the ungodly are basically us, people who are undeserving of God's grace. And having said that in verse 7 and 8, um, he says, For one will hardly die for a righteous man, though perhaps for the good man someone would dare even to die. And yet... Christ died for the ungodly. You, know, you can understand if someone says, you know, I'll sacrifice life for you know, so-and-so. You know, he's a righteous person. Um, you know, people sometimes die for their country, for their kings. That's somehow understandable. But for the ungodly and for someone who's without strength to come. In fact, it goes on to say in verse 8, someone who was sinner and ungodly, those who have turned away from God, it's not usual, and it's not 
logical in our minds that God would have to come and die in our place, Jesus Christ. But that's what he did. And then it goes on to the second stage in verse 8. He demonstrates his own love toward us. He does not only say that he loves us, he demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still yet sinners, Christ died for us. So he's repeating that. Look, he died for us when we were without strength. He died for us when we were still sinners and we were ungodly, when we were against him. He died for sinners, not for the righteous people. Need I remind you that Christ died for sinners and not the righteous? Unless you realize this truth and repent of your sin and come in faith to Jesus Christ, you cannot be saved. We know that. That's clear from the Bible. So it goes on from being weak and to sinners. And then worse, it gets more intense. It says that we were enemies of God under the wrath of God. Look at verse 9. Much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. Because, for if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through his death, the death of Jesus, Jesus Christ, then much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. So by doing that, he's making it so clear and so strong that we are saved by his life that was sacrificed for us. And this all happened when we were without strength, when we were yet sinners, and we were still enemies of God and under the wrath of God. But of course, if you remain under the wrath of God, then the final eternal place for you is eternal hell. It's like having a sharp dagger. Imagine that. If you have a sharp dagger hanging above your head on a very thin hairline thread, and it follows you wherever you go, and in, at any moment it can cut and pierce through your skull and kill you instantly. It's, it's like that, to be under the wrath of God. If you have no peace with God, and if you are still at enmity with God, that's where you stand. But of course, we are saved from that wrath, wrath of God. We are saved from that judgment through Jesus Christ. So when we come to the most intense stage in verse 10, this is what we read again. For if while we were still enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son. Now let's stop there for a moment. What would it be like to live with God as your enemy? People don't often think about this. I mean, you talk to even unbelievers and they never would consider themselves as enemies of God. They may not be believers, and they may have been sometimes hostile towards Christianity or even uh, evangelists, you know, Christians may, may be making some fun of them and so on, but they wouldn't consider themselves enemies of God. But we know the Bible tells us that they are, and we were enemies of God when we did not believe in Him. Many people just do not know because of simple ignorance. Still, they know they have no peace. They are still at war with God. Actually, we know that everybody is either or has been an enemy of God. And so were we. Such were some of you. No one comes to this world as a Christian. We come to this world as sinners, and we are in need of Savior and salvation and forgiveness of sins. Therefore, that's a default position that everybody is in. They just don't realize that. Surely they will realize that when they stand before the judgment of God, if they go past the line of death without accepting Christ as their Savior. In fact, the only reason why some of us are saved is because Christ died for us and he reconciled us to God. He actually came and initiated that process, peacemaking process between us and God. In, in all of this, um, you'll see also this ex expression twice. In verse 9, it says, much more. The same expression is found also um, in, uh, in, in the previous, in fact, verse 10, verse 9 and 10, much more. And he says also in verse 10, much more, having been reconciled, 
You see all these comparative language all throughout the passage. He's going not only from stage one to three, but in each of the stage, he's going, look, if this is what could happen, just imagine what this is. Sometimes someone can die for righteous people, but look, he died for the sinners and ungodly. And if that's the case, then much more we are saved by his grace and through his life. So Paul uses comparative language here. So sometimes you feel that it is almost too much because he says again and again almost every verse. Of course, the reason is he's you know, making the emphasis there. He's, make, he's making the point. And it's almost like as you read this passage, and if you read it again and again, um, this passage comes alive. And you feel almost as if that this, this passage is holding you by the hand, and it's like a little child taking you to the zoo and Look at this animal. Look, look at the lion. Look at the tiger. Look at the elephant. It gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And Paul's doing that. This passage is doing that. It's taking us through what salvation is really, what salvation really is through Jesus Christ. And he's saying, look, we were saved when we were still without strength. We were saved when we were still sinners. And, and much more. If that's the case, then you know, just imagine how great his sacrifice is and we are saved, in fact, when we were still enemies of God. He came and made peace with us. And surely that means that we are saved. We shall be saved by his life that was given in our place. We shall be saved by his life. It's the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. So, God made peace with us by having his son, Jesus, killed on the cross when we were still his enemies. Does that strike you? I mean, this ought to strike certain people. People realize that they are, in fact, enemies of God. I mean, if there's one being who you do not want as your enemy, it would be God. I mean, that little boy in my high school years is not being compared to God. Even that made me feel uncomfortable. Being at enmity with God ought to make people tremble, fearful, and of course, drawing them towards Christ with repentance and faith. Now, this is what God did, and this is what Paul's explaining. Now, we understand this now. Let's not compare that with what the world says or what the world does. The popular storyline in many stories, whether they are written in novels or produced into films, is revenge, destroying the enemy. And that's been all-time popular theme of any interesting stories. And this person, the character in the story, spends years in sometimes training and planning the master plan to pay back and to revenge. And, and we sometimes feel um, a little bit of uh, you know, excitement in that. We, we get some joy in seeing those stories. I think it actually stimulates our sinful senses to revenge your perpetual enemy, whether it's to keep your family honor or to pay back for your father or your parents or your loved one, whatever it is. You, know, you, you go and prepare and plan for years and years, and eventually you end up killing your enemy. And, you know, that, that's usually the happy ending of, of the stories. It's a payback thing. Eye for eye, tooth for tooth. And that seems sometimes even noble in this world. But that's very you know, polar opposite from what God did. It may be popular, but it's not really biblical. In fact, let me show you a few verses here. If you have your Bibles, I invite you to look at this verse. I'm sure you've seen it, but I want you to see it in your own Bibles. Matthew chapter, chapter 5. In Matthew chapter 5, Jesus is giving a long discourse here. As you know, this is the Sermon on the Mount. And verse 43, this is what he says. Matthew 5, 43. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. For he causes his son to rise on the evil and the good, and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. 
For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even tax collectors do the same? Even if you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? Therefore, you are to be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Jesus is saying, this is how you can be perfect like God is perfect, by loving your enemies. You have heard that people said, you can hate your enemy, and I guess rightly so. But God says, love your enemies, love your enemies. I'm going to quote uh, a quote from someone else. This is not my quote, but I really like this. So I wrote it down somewhere, and this is what it says. If God did not love his enemies, there would be no Christians. Think about that. We were enemies of God, as we read in Romans 5. And God loved us so much that he sent his son to die in our place. And that's how we became Christians. And Jesus taught this. And just exactly how he said and he taught here, he did exactly on the cross. You know, what he taught, he did on the cross. We are Christians because God loved his enemies. And the enemy is none other than myself. I was at enmity with God. And we were all at enmity with God before we became Christians. John 3.16, the famous verse that you would all, I'm sure, be able to recite and memorize, right? God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son that you know, whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. God so loved the world. That's how he loved the world that was at enmity with him, by sending his son and dying in our place while we were enemies. Christ died for us because he loved us. And that's what Romans 5.10 says. And that's why even verse 7 makes sense. If you go back to Romans 5 in 7, look, for one will hardly die for a righteous man. And though perhaps for the, the good man, someone would dare even to die. The world's vernacular is, you kill your enemy. And you might die for the righteous person, you might die for someone on your own side, but if that's what, this, what happens in this world, this is what happened with God, and that is, he died for us when we were enemies of God. And that's why it, it makes it so much um, you know, stronger and more powerful. I'm going to show you another example um, in Matthew 23, and you can see the heart of God, the, the God who loved his people. In Matthew chapter 23, Jesus now comes to the city of Jerusalem and he's really lamenting, he's really crying for Jerusalem. In verse 37, he says, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her. How often I wanted to gather your children together the way a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, and yet you did not want it. Have you seen the mother hen trying to protect the, the baby chicks? It's quite phenomenal. And you might think that's just a chicken, but no, mother hen is most probably the most bravest thing at that time when it is under threat, especially the, the chicks are under the threat. And God uses the picture and says, look, I tried to gather you under my wings, but you were not willing. You did not want it. How often? What you see here is, is God's lament. He is really crying out, Look, how often I wanted to gather your children together, like hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you are not willing. It's not so much an indictment. He, 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 this is really complete disappointment, even disheartened. He shows his emotion towards the people of Israel. And that's how much he loved his people. And of course, Jesus died for them as well, you know, for those who would believe. And Jewish people, and Gentile people, you know, whoever believes in Christ can be saved. And you can see that God loved them so much. And even at this stage, just before Jesus' crucifixion, he is saying, look, this is how I love you. 
And this is how I came, and that, that's how Jesus died. To pay the penalty for all our sins so that we would believe and come to Christ for salvation and for peace with God. Another example that came to my mind was the story of the prodigal son, Luke chapter 15. You know the story very well. The story of the, the lost son of the prodigal son, he goes off with all his possession, inheritance from the father. By doing that, he's putting himself at enmity with the father. He's saying, I don't care about you, dad. You know, just give me my money and I'll be off. He goes and he spends all and becomes dirt poor. But you can see that in the story all along, from the moment that the son asked for the inheritance, the father's love did not change. To start with, the father actually gave him money because he insisted. And it looks like that the father has been waiting for him. It says clearly that the father saw the son first when the son was returning to the village, to home. He ran, embraced him, and when he tried to say, look, make me one of your hired servants. He didn't actually say that. He, he thought about that before. The father said, no, not a chance. Bring the best robe, sandal, and the ring, and we're going to have a party because my son is now is, is alive. He was lost, he's found, he was dead, but now he's alive. The father's love had never changed. And that's the kind of love that God has for lost sinners. We have in both of these pictures a picture of compassionate God. God with mercy and loving kindness. God who is willing to take his enemies under his arms. God who is so eager to forgive and eager to embrace people who would come to him in repentance and faith. In Isaiah chapter 40, verse 2, this is a kind of prophecy, obviously, being, being Isaiah, but this is what it says. Just listen to the language here. Isaiah 40, verse 1 and 2. Let me read those verses here. This is God speaking through Isaiah to the people of Israel. Comfort, O oh comfort my people, says your God. Speak to the heart of Jerusalem and call out to her that her warfare has been fulfilled or ended, that her iniquity has been removed, pardoned, removed, that she has received from the hand of Yahweh, double for all her sins. By going through the punishment from God for rejecting Jesus Christ, God is now compassionate and saying that, look, they, they paid double for their sins, all received. So now the warfare is ended, it has been fulfilled. And iniquity has been removed and pardoned. So speak to them, comfort, comfort my people. You have peace with God. This is call from the loving Father God, inviting them to come to him because even though they were enemies of God, at enmity with God, God is loving them and graciously embracing them and bringing them back. God's heart and arms are open for now. But of course, if you reject, then you may place yourself at enmity with God by your choice, and final place will be eternal hell. Now, in looking at this story, um, I've got about three sort of conclusions or three applications. Now, for some people, I don't know, but maybe some of you are still at that place. You're still at enmity with God. Listen to this in 2 Corinthians 5.20. This is what God would say to those people who are still at enmity with God, people who are not yet saved, you know, people who are not Christians yet. In chapter 5, verse 20, 2 Corinthians, So then, we Christians are ambassadors for Christ, as God is pleading through us. So we beg you, on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. Now, preaching the gospel is preaching the command to believe, to repent and to believe. But it is also as much a plea and begging. And just as Paul says here, we beg you, 
And I'm sure that some of you have experienced that as you are tra trying to reach your unsaved families or friends with the gospel. Sometimes they are so uh, adamant and, and they reject that you come to a point where you are almost begging, you are pleading and speaking to their hearts. Look, all I am saying is that you've got to believe in Jesus Christ. And if you had your way like this, not believing in Jesus, then you will end up in eternal hell. You speak out of compassion and care and love and concern for them. And Paul says, we are ambassadors for Christ. And as God is pleading, see that? It says, not we, God is pleading through us. And therefore, we beg you, on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. And this is a message, message of evangelism. This is the gospel. And this is what we train people to do, to be evangelists, to be church planters and to be pastors, to preach and to teach the word of God beginning with the gospel and the whole counsel of God. And then also I have a message for, for Christians from the same passage, really. As he says here in verse 20, we are ambassadors for Christ. So if you are saved, and if you are Christians, then this is what you are to do. This, this, you go and you tell them the gospel as ambassadors for Christ. Look at verse 18. He says, now all things are from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. The gospel ministry is also the, gospel, the ministry of reconciliation. By preaching the gospel, you bring people to be at peace with God. And you do that by pleading with them, even to the point of pleading and begging them. At times you command, at times you proclaim, you sometimes even have to give them some harsh messages. The truth in the Bible that God is holy and righteous and He cannot tolerate sin. But on the other hand, you can become soft and gentle and gracious and merciful just like God is and just like Paul used to do and Timothy and all the preachers of the gospel did. So you've got, on one hand, admonition. and you've got also, on the other hand, you're gentle, gently drawing them to the gospel as ambassadors for Christ. If you're also, uh, if you're a Christian, then you have kind of come from the enemy territory to God's side, isn't it? So no longer is God your enemy. He is your friend. Jesus calls us friends. You know, what a friend we have in Jesus. More than friend, but friend certainly. If you're on this side, then what is the world? Sometimes Christians treat the world as still enemies to hate. They may be enemies, but what does the Bible say? What did Jesus say? Love your enemies. They are, yes, they are enemies and they are still enemies with God, but it is not to make us to hate them or to even attack them. There's no place for like Christian uh, militants or, you know, guerrillas. You know, we, we love them. They are enemies to love. And we often forget that. We forget that they are mission field. We forget that we need to love them with the gospel, even though they are enemies. And that's why we can do what Jesus said. When they persecute you and say all kinds of evil things against you, rejoice, Jesus said, because great is reward in heaven for you. And you may not understand that at first, but you understand that when you understand that you are to love your enemies. Now also, um, there's one more point. There are also some other people. Now these people may call themselves Christians. Not complete unbelievers. So they say, well, you know, we're not enemy, at enmity with God. You know, we are not enemies of God anymore. We are, we are Christians. I'm Christian. But then again, that person or those people might not be so passionate in the things of God. You know, somewhat lukewarm like the church in Laodicea. Now, let, let me turn to James and show you this verse. James chapter 4, verse 4. James chapter 4, verse 4. You adulteresses... You do, do you not know that friendship with the world is hostility or enmity with God? Hostility toward God or enmity with God? Therefore, 
whoever wishes to be a friend of the world sets himself as an enemy of God. Now, James is writing to churches. He's writing to people in the church. Some of them are saved. Some of them are not saved. Whether you're saved or not, if you want to be a friend of this world, then you are actually setting yourself to be an enemy of God. And of course, if you're really saved, you would not want to go back to that place. You don't want to be an enemy of God. Again, you cannot be an enemy of God once you're saved. So maybe that's, there are some, some people who think that they're saved, but they're not saved. And the fact that they want to go back and back to the world and they feel drawn to the world again and again may be an indication or even proof that they're not saved. Whatever the case, those people who want to be friends of this world, you're actually making yourself an enemy of God. And this ought to be a really um, a sobering message for especially you know, those people, lukewarm people. True, true Christians cannot be true friends with the world. I mean, you, you wouldn't feel comfortable. It's almost like if you are in sort of worldly setting, you're not easy, you're not comfortable, you, you feel tense and conflicted inside because you belong not there, but you belong in the house of God. But if you feel happy and content and you have absolutely no problem in enjoying the pleasures of this world without even thinking about the things of God, the household of God, the ministry of the gospel, reconciliation, then perhaps that's where you belong. And by your friends, you're actually defining yourself or you're making yourself known. And I guess you can ask this question, what is your address? There used to be this thing called the permanent address. You know, wherever you live, you have residential address, but you have your permanent address, where you are from, your hometown sort of thing. Where is your permanent address? Is it in the household of God, or is it in this world? Whatever the case, the Bible says it very clearly that God is gracious, and if you repent and believe in Christ, you can enjoy peace. You can find peace and enjoy peace. And think about this. Peace with God is far greater and better than any pleasure of sin. Well, let me pray. Father, we thank you for this time to think about your words and it is a frightening thing to think that we were enemies of God. But so thankfully, you made peace with us. You reconciled us to yourself. We are so grateful and thank you for that. But there are still people who are at enmity with God. And our heart goes out to them. Lord, we pray that we can go and tell them this message. Tell them with your wisdom, with grace and love but conviction and faithfulness and fortitude so that we can tell them the truth as it is, but in the most gracious and loving kind way, just as God is. Give us this wisdom, Lord, to do that and teach us how to do that well and teach us so that we can teach even others and that they can teach yet others so that this ministry can go on. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.